All right, so it's one o'clock right now, and uh, that's the time we're supposed to begin. We have some of the participants are here. I think I'm going to stall for a few minutes in case some people show up late. Um, all right, just hold on one minute. All right, if uh, several people just signed in, I think we, uh, we can get started. Does that sound good to everybody? Okay, so um, welcome to our webinar today. Um, my name is Lynn Kalania. I'm the new executive director of Roebling Museum. I started in February. I'm very glad to be here, having lots of fun learning how to run a museum during a pandemic as we, we're all learning how to do things during a pandemic. Um, so uh, today, the, the program you're, you're attending, it's called Roebling Road Trip. And this is a series of virtual programs that we hope to do a lot of different times. We have an, one more on the, the schedule that's, and we'll, we'll share at the end the secret of where the next one's gonna be. The details are to follow and everyone who signed up signed up for this particular program you're going to be on our email list so you'll get the information um, once that is available but i'm going to keep you in suspense until the end of this program till you hear where the next one's going to be um, and uh, one of the things that we definitely want to hear from anybody who's attending or people who have any kind of interest if you think of other places that we might want to go virtually that have significance to the roebling family the roebling um, bridges, anything related to sort of the, the Roebling history. Um, we, you know, someone had suggested that we find someone who studies the Golden Gate Bridge to talk about um, some aspect of the history there. So there's lots of different options and we definitely love to hear from you guys about that. Um, but today this program, the way things are going to work, um, we have Fred here who's going to talk a little bit about his presentation. We also have um, Martha Moore, who's the board chair over at Roebling Museum, and she's going to sort of be the MC. She's going to, uh, one of the things that I like to say is, you know, normally you're told to hold your questions to the end, but don't hold your questions to the end. During this program, please write them in the little Q&A section, the bottom of your screen throughout. So if something hits you while Fred's talking, you like a picture, whatever, um, send the question immediately because I'm gonna be going through there and funneling those over to Martha and she and Fred are gonna have a conversation about the things that you bring up. So I'm not gonna talk anymore. I'm gonna kick it over to Martha who's gonna do some talking now. Okay, step one, unmute. Thank you, Lynn. And um, thank you everybody who got on the Zoom call for this fun program. Uh, I'm Martha Moore. I am on the board of the Roebling Museum. I'm also a volunteer. I've been involved with the museum since it was the glimmer in the eye of the local folks in Roebling who wanted to start a museum to um, talk about their history as an important part of the industrialization of the United States in the late 19th, early 20th century. The Roebling Museum is, which you can see behind me through the miracle of Zoom, is located in Roebling, New Jersey, a former company town built in 1905 on the Delaware in central New Jersey. Um, it was built by the John A. Roebling Sons Company which were makers of wire rope and builders of the big suspension bridges uh, of their era, starting with the Cincinnati Bridge and the Brooklyn Bridge, the Golden Gate and the George Washington are probably four of the best known. Um, the museum is located in the original gatehouse to the mill and wire mills that bring and programs like this one, bring to life the story of the people who lived and worked in the company town, as well as the role of Roebling Engineering, the company, and the Roebling family in the industrial transformation of the U.S. Um, today, 
uh, our speaker is Fred Caesar from the Saxonburg Museum in Saxonburg, Pennsylvania, outside of Pittsburgh. And he is going to talk about the history of that town, which was founded by John A. Roebling when he came to the United States. So uh, I'm excited to hear about this because as well as being a volunteer at the museum, I'm also a Roebling descendant. So this is my immigration story that Fred is gonna talk about. Many of the folks in Roebling who worked in the mills were new Americans at the time. It was a hub of immigration from Eastern Europe, um, but it all started with John A. Roebling when he immigrated from Prussia in 1831. Fred is uh, the volunteer curator of the Sachsenberg Museum. He's a native of St. Louis, where I don't think they have any big bridges, Fred. Um, he retired, he spent his career in TV and radio news and in public relations. And when he retired from working in Washington, he uh, retired to Sachsenberg and became involved with the Sachsenberg Museum. And for his sins, he was then asked to take over the museum and become its curator. Uh, Saxonburg is the town founded by John A. And it's one that has worked very hard to preserve its history and to memorialize its special place in American history. And that's what Fred is gonna tell us about. So thank you very much for joining us. And please do uh, put your questions in the chat and we'll save time to answer them at the end. Welcome Fred. Thank you, uh, Martha and Lynn. Can you, am I on the screen? I don't see myself, so you I- You are yeah, on the we screen. we hear you great. Okay, all right, thank you so much. Thank you, Martha and Lynn. Uh, let me put my uh, PowerPoint up here. All right. So for those of you who have not been in this area of Western Pennsylvania, I hope uh, you'll learn something about Saxonburg and the Roebling legacy. I'll provide a overview. Worked in rehearsal. <laughs> I'll provide an overview about uh, Saxonburg and John Augustus Roebling, Saxonburg's founder and engineer, who during his time here began his legacy as the foremost designer and builder of wire rope suspension bridges in the 19th century. Saxonburg, just like uh, the fantastic Brooklyn Bridge, is the result of one man and his family. John Roebling co-founded Saxonburg, and, and this is where he developed his wire rope cable technique and twisting machinery that eventually led to his crowning achievement of the Brooklyn Bridge along the East River in New York. The Roebling legacy in America and Saxonburg began this way. John Roebling was born on June 12, 1806 in the town of Mühlhausen in Prussia, now the center of modern day Germany. He was the youngest of five children. He was well-educated, attending top engineering institutes. He became frustrated with the Prussian government controls. John and his older brother Carl decided to relocate away from Prussia. The country of choice was the United States. A friend of the Roeblings had returned to the Mühlhausen from a visit to the United States and was singing the praises of the new world. Here are some important points. The Roebling brothers and a small group of like-minded immigrants left their homeland on May 11, 1831. Instead of the planned six-week voyage, it took 11 weeks to cross the Atlantic due to storms. Their ship docked at Philadelphia on August 3, 1831. The Roeblings did not agree with slavery and would not settle in the South. They were told to go west, but not the frontier land of the far west, uh, just western Pennsylvania or eastern Ohio. After scouting out territory in the Pittsburgh region, Roebling eventually bought land that had formerly been part of the 7,000 acre estate of Robert Morris. Morris was one of the financiers of the American Revolution and a signer of the Declaration of Independence. Due to financial issues, Morris sold some of his land to a lawyer whose widow sold 1,600 acres, including a farmhouse, at $1.37 per acre to the Roebling brothers on October 28, 1831. So it's an anniversary coming up very soon. The Roeblings originally established the area as a farming community. 
but it became a very prosperous town of commerce. Roebling wrote letters to friends and family in Mulhausen, hoping to encourage others to immigrate. His first letter describing the area was written with chicken quills and said to be 100 pages long. The strategy worked with more immigrating from Prussia in 1832. It was said that they were more skilled and better educated than most immigrants. Among the immigrants was Ernest Herding, his wife and three daughters. Mr. Herding was a tailor. John Roebling married one of the daughters in 1836 and their first child, Washington Roebling, was born here in Saxonburg in May of 1837. Roebling had surveyed the land and drawn up a plan for laying out a village on a hillside. The settlement was originally called Germania, but the name was soon changed to Sachsenburg in German and then became the English version Saxonburg. This illustration was drawn by a local artist in July of 1835. It is said that John Roebling sent it back to a cousin in Prussia who printed copies. The illustration was discovered by Colonel Washington Roebling when he visited Germany later in life. On the crest of the hill, you'll see uh, it lines up about 11 houses that were either log cabins or block houses. Saxonburg remains as Roebling laid out the town. He laid out a village which was approximately one square mile in size. It is done in the true German style, one broad main street running exactly east and west, that's in the red oval, one broad main street and then, ex uh, then flanked by lots which were from 100 to 200 feet in width and ran back almost a half a mile. That was so each family had a little form to themselves as is the custom in Germany. Water Street runs parallel to Main Street and was considered the poorer quarter of town. In 1832, much of the land was still virgin forest, mostly black oak. It took many years to clear the land and build the homes and shops. The map on the left is the main section of town as mapped in 1874, based on the plan of the Roeblings in 1832. The Google map on the right is as the town is laid out today. You can see Main Street, Water Street, and the other streets laid out exactly as Roebling planned. There have been only two streets added, and there are still no alleys, although the original plots have been subdivided. John Roebling erected a substantial two-story home near the east end of West Main Street, employing heavy timber frame construction with brick nogging inserted in the spaces between the framing members. The bricks came from a brick making area the Roeblings had established on East Main Street. In the building, there still remains many original wood features as well as some of the original door hardware. This is a rare 1904 photo of the Roebling house that was found in the files of Emily Warren Roebling, the wife of John Roebling's son, Colonel Washington Roebling. The notation indicates that Colonel Washington Roebling was born in this house. In fact, while living in Saxonburg, John and Johanna Roebling had six children. Washington Augustus, seen on the screen left, was the oldest. He was born in Saxonburg on May 26, 1837. Also born in Saxonburg in this house on February 26, 1842, was Ferdinand William Roebling Sr., seen on the screen right. He was the great-great-great-grandfather of our host, Martha Moore. Washington helped to take care of his brother, Ferdinand, who was five years younger, and his three younger sisters. Ferdinand and his br elder brother, Washington, then became partners in the family business. As lead engineer, Washington Roebling brought the Brooklyn Bridge to completion in 1883. Ferdinand focused on administration and the family's other business interests. This is what the house looks like today. It is the office of the Saxonburg Memorial Presbyterian Church. John Robley did not really practice organized religion. He was said to be Lutheran, but not in the strictest sense. Like many intellectuals of the time, his beliefs were based in spiritualism, but he knew that, community, he knew that the community he founded needed a church. At the head of Main Street along Rebecca Street, John Roebling donated land for a church. His first design, shown to the screen left, was a majestic building based on the cathedrals of his homeland. 
but neither he nor the town folks could afford such a building. So Roebling came up with a simpler design. Construction began in 1836. In 1837, church services were held in the newly constructed German Evangelical Protestant Church. The steeple and bell were added in 1863. A large four-faced Seth Thomas tower clock was added in 1920. Sermons were in German until 1904. The church stands at the highest point at the head of West Main Street and is the focal point of town. Before COVID restrictions this year, a service was still held on Sunday mornings in the church, now affiliated with the Saxonburg Memorial Presbyterian Church. In regards to John's older brother, Carl, he took care of the farm that was located to the north side outside of the main town. Carl donated land on the western part of the town for the Saxonburg Memorial Cemetery. Little did he know that he would be one of the first persons buried there. Carl developed malaria during their travels across Pennsylvania from Philadelphia in 1831, somewhere near Carlisle, Pennsylvania. This circumstance had some bearing on the ultimate selection of Butler County, said to be at that time one of the healthiest spots in the state. But in 1837, Carl suffered sunstroke while working in a wheat field and died. Carl's daughter, Amelia, is also buried in Saxonburg Memorial Cemetery. When she died in 1933, she was the last direct descendant of the Roebling family to live here in Saxonburg. By the way, Chris Roebling, the great, great, great grandson of John Roebling and his family, visited Saxonburg for our, our 185th anniversary celebration in 2017 and placed wreaths at both grave sites. In addition to Chris Roebling and his family visiting the graves, also participating was an official delegation from Roebling's homeland and our sister city, Mühlhausen. A member of the visiting delegation, Frank Mueller, asked to speak next. When he did, he surprised us. He brought with him a jar of dirt from Mühlhausen. Some of the earth from Mühlhausen was then placed on Carl's grave on July 15, 2017. The jar of remaining soil was donated to Saxonburg Museum. The notation on the jar reads, this earth from Mühlhausen, Germany, may give the resting place and last farewell from home to a son of our city, Carl Frederick Roebling, 1803 to 1837, who left his homeland in 1832 to find over the ocean a better life. Rest in peace. A very, very touching moment here in Saxonburg and a uniting of the Roebling homeland with their first homeland in the U.S. In that same year that his brother died and his first son was born, John, John Roebling became a U.S. citizen on September 30, 1837. He completed his paperwork at the Butler County, Pennsylvania Courthouse, as this document shows. This is a photo of the original document on file at the courthouse. Now, truth be told, John Roebling failed as a farmer. With poor soil conditions, his plan for establishing a thriving farming community ultimately failed. Several accounts say that while he was a brilliant public figure, in private, he loomed over a household of gloom, silent meals, and rigid structure and discipline. It is said that in his spare time, he studied and wrote about science and philosophy and played the flute, violin, and piano. He was fluent in German, French, and English. He was a believer in hydropathy, the therapeutic use of water. He took Turkish baths, mineral baths, and said that, quote, a full cold bath every day is indispensable. He required others in his family to take similar cold baths. And he would drink gallons of water daily. Also, he would drink concoctions of raw egg, charcoal, warm water, and turpentine. The world should be thankful for his, uh, let's say, fortunate failure as a farmer, because that led him to returning to engineering, where he made many significant contributions. In 1837, he secured work as an engineer surveyor with the state of Pennsylvania. 
While working near Johnstown, Pennsylvania, about an hour east of here, he noticed that the hemp rope used for hauling canal boats up the inclines along the Allegheny Portage Railroad were breaking easily and causing dangerous working conditions. This illustration depicts a boat on rails being pulled up a steep hill into a large shed. He proposed the use of wire rope cables about an inch in diameter to replace the hemp rope that could be up to nine inches in diameter and frequently breaking. Back here in Saxonburg on the grounds of Roebling Park in Saxonburg is the preserved wire rope workshop where John Roebling perfected the wire rope cable. This building dates back to the late 1830s and is considered by many historians as, a, as an example of a German settler's house. It was never used as a house, however, for the Roeblings. It was used as Roebling's workshop until he left Saxonburg for New Jersey in 1849. It was built down the hill to the north of the Roebling house in the church. This photo is said to be from 1932. This is another rare photo dated 1904, found in the files of Emily Warren Roebling, again, the wife of John Roebling's son, Colonel Washington Roebling. The notation reads, part of the old rope shop at Saxonburg, PA, where John A. Roebling made his first wire rope in 1840. This is what the wire rope workshop looks like today. The building and land was donated to the borough of Saxonburg in 1968 by Carl Winsel and Lydia Winsel Hasseltine, whose parents purchased the property from the Roebling family in the late 1800s. The building was in declining conditions in the late 1960s. In the mid 1970s, the building had been restored and moved from its location at the corner of Rebecca and Water Street to further within the, what has become Roebling Park. At that time, Back when Roebling was here, it was called the Meadows. This was, the move was to protect the building since it was located so close to the street corner. The building was placed on the National Register of Historic Places in November of 1976. This is what the building looks like on the inside. There are two rooms on the first floor divided by a stairway to the attic area. It still has many original timbers, floorboards, and wattle wall stuffing, which is basically clay, mud, and straw. There was never wire twisting machinery kept in the building, but it is believed John Roebling may have had a workbench in one room where he experimented with wire rope cable techniques and a drafting area in another room. On the walls are hanging drawings of the twisting devices drawn by John Roebling in 1848 the last year he was still here in Saxonburg. And here you see the stairs to the upper level, as well as the ceiling tempers. You can see that they were hacked by ax to square them off and not cut with a saw. The timbers are believed to be black oak, which grew in the forest that was just adjacent to the building. It was in the wire rope workshop that Roebling perfected the wire rope cable and the process to twist it. He submitted paperwork for a U.S. patent in March of 1841. Then on July 16, 1842, 178 years ago, Roebling was granted patent number 2720. The patent was for a unique cable wrapping device, which is seen here. That device is in the inventory of the Smithsonian Institute, but not on display. From that time here in Saxonburg in 1842, wire rope and bridge building dominated the rest of Roebling's life. As I mentioned earlier, Chris Roebling, the great-great-grandson of John Roebling, visited Saxonburg in 2017 for our anniversary celebration. He visited with his two sons, August and Chase. They toured the wire rope workshop on July 16, 2017. That was exactly 175 years to the day, to that date, that his great, great, great grandfather received the first wire rope patent. To make the wire rope cable, Roebling laid out a wire rope walk that extended almost 2,500 feet. 
The twisting machinery, machinery was outside the workshop and operated by hand. This illustration is, is described as an artist's conception of the process over time. The wire rope walk didn't always have rails, especially to the full length of the walk. No horsepower or steam power was applicable or even available at the early days, and it was always driven by men. This is a diorama on display at the Saxonburg Museum, but made by a Saxonburg police officer from the illustration you just saw. The iron wire was brought from mills on barges on the Allegheny River and unloaded about 10 miles east of Saxonburg. Specially made wagons brought the raw product to Saxonburg to be twisted into cable and then taken back to Freeport, Pennsylvania to be shipped to where it was needed. While accounts vary, it's believed eight to 10 men recruited from the area spliced together long strands of the iron wire. Then every week to 10 days, a larger crew of up to 18 men twisted the strands together to form the inch thick cable. The men were said to have been paid well and received free meals cooked by Roebling's wife. Work was from sunrise to sunset, three meals with a snack of bread and butter in between, including whiskey. In February 2016, the Lewes Company of Connecticut donated to the, Saint, the Saxonburg Museum a replica piece of wire rope cable on John Roebling's, based on John Roebling's original design of six strands around a middle core. The effect of this design was to reduce the space inside the rope, tightly packing the wires together, which gave the rope greater stability under load. The same concept was used on the cables on the Brooklyn Bridge and other bridges he built and designed. So wire rope launched Roebling's bridge building career. The ones listed in blue on the screen were projects that he did while he was still here in Saxonburg. I should also note that during these years, Roebling continued to perfect the wire rope cable process and was granted several more patents. In 1847, he was granted patent number 4945 that further perfected the suspension bridge twisted wire rope cable. Over time, he built several successful suspension bridges using his cables in prominent locations such as Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, and at Niagara Falls. In 1848, Roebling decided he needed to expand capacity. As you're aware, he bought 25 acres southeast of Trenton, New Jersey. During the summer and fall of 1849, he moved his family and his wire rope making, Saxonburg, uh, making from Saxonburg to Trenton, New Jersey. This drawing is the first wire rope workshop he built in Trenton, and I just show it because it shows you that he built a larger building than he had here in Saxonburg. Some say that if there had been a railroad line placed near Saxonburg prior to 1848, John Roebling might have built a factory here instead. By the way, once he left Saxonburg, John Roebling never returned, despite coming back to Saxonburg to build a bridge in 18. 80, uh, 1857 to 1859. It is said, however, that his wife did return briefly during that time to visit her relatives. And Colonel Washington Roebling visited Saxonburg twice, in 1858 and in 1868. Here in Saxonburg, we don't have a statue of Roebling, but a Pennsylvania historical marker. It makes note of not only John Roebling founding Saxonburg and manufacturing wire rope cable, but also the birth of his first son, Washington Roebling here in Saxonburg. On the grounds of Roebling Park, where the wire rope workshop and the Saxonburg Museum are located, there is a replica of the Brooklyn Bridge donated in 2001. It was built originally as a parade float before the stone towers were built to preserve the bridge deck and sides as our memorial to the Brooklyn Bridge and the Roebling family's crowning bridge achievement. The adjacent Saxonburg Museum has a room dedicated to the Roebling le legacy. It includes background and photos of various bridges built and are designed by John Roebling and his sons. There are sample documents from various projects and tools 
used by the Roebling Company. The uh, Saxonburg Museum is generally open during the summers, but unfortunately COVID caused us to be closed this, this year. And we're hope, hopeful that change, things will change in the future. And Saxonburg Museum and its adjacent Cooper Hall were the location of the world premiere special first screening of the Roebling's Bridge film in December of 2017. The producer, director, and three lead actors were present and spent the evening discussing the film and Roebling history with 120 local residents. This video is a portion of what the independent producer hopes to be a full length video about the Roebling legacy for the history or Smithsonian channels someday. Saxonburg was incorporated as a borough in 1846 and remains as an iconic town in Butler County, Pennsylvania, thanks to the immigrants who came from Prussia and elsewhere. Their descendants and others who followed them remain in the area today. Our population is about 1400. Our West Main Street is also listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Most of the buildings are more than 150 years old, many more than 100 years old. So I invite you to come to Saxonburg. We're located in Butler County, Pennsylvania. I looked it up. You're 338 miles from Roebling, New Jersey to come to Saxonburg. Come and visit firsthand where Roebling legacy began in America. And thank you for the invitation to speak with you today. And I look forward to your questions and answers. And I wanna thank Lynn and Martha again for the invitation. Oh, okay. Thank you, Fred. That was really interesting. Thank you. You're Much welcome. appreciated. Um, now, I want to tell everybody watching that you can put your chat, your questions in the Q&A down at the bottom of your screen. You see a little Q&A. You click on that. You can enter a question. Or if you can't figure that out, you can also put it in the chat. Um, but I have a question, and I get to go first. Um, were there other, at the time when Roebling was making wire rope in Saxonburg, um, were other people still farming or did, were there other little you know, proto-industry manufacturing operations going on that you're aware of? Or was he the only game in town? Well, he was the main game in town, let's put it that way. Uh, he... Uh, uh, he was he was the town for a long period of time there, but uh, there was farming going on. But again, uh, they had to clear so much of the land, uh, and it was not really a prosperous area. Quite frankly, uh, when they were setting up the town, he uh, some of the business that came when he wrote letters back. Uh, one of the people that came uh, was a, a family that he knew back in Mühlhausen called it was named the Morhoff family, and they came and opened a store here on Main Street in eighteen. 30, they came in 1832, the store was owned by 1834, and it remained in one family's operation on Main Street until 1989. So that Moorhoff family had a long spread here. But uh, in a sense, uh, there were several hotels uh, at one time. They had some taverns, some bars. Uh, there was uh, uh, several general stores. We were kind of a stop. Uh, if people are familiar, we were between Pittsburgh, Erie. Uh, so we were somewhat of a stop at that time. Uh, as people went from Pittsburgh to Butler, there is a, a town named Butler, and then on to Erie to our north. So we were a stop for uh, people uh, that were on a, a path uh, to, uh, to go between northern Pennsylvania and southern Pennsylvania. Uh, but uh, so it, it was known there. There were, uh, again, several general stores, and uh, some people started like banks. Uh, several uh, There were two doctors in town. Um well, the questions are pouring in, so let me ask. Um, you've kind of answered this, but maybe you want to talk more about it. Trish, uh, Trish Strajewski, who's also a board member and a volunteer, wants to know, is it true that the whole town of Saxonburg became involved in the wire rope making process? In essence, yes, uh, because he needed all the work of people here to make the cable. He, it was just he and his brother, and of course, after he died, it was just him. Uh, so uh, in 1837, so he needed the people and uh, he did have one person that was kind of a manager that I understand he did pay uh, as somewhat of someone to help. But uh, no, he was very, very dependent on the calling together the uh, businessmen, uh, the farmers and all of them to come together to help twist the cable, which they rightfully and, and from my understanding were glad to do. 
because uh, they realized it was uh, uh, it was making uh, Saxonburg very 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 uh, notable around the, uh, the country. Um, so another question, Elizabeth Beyer wants to know. How long did Saxonburg maintain its Germanic character? How, do, is it still, does it he'll still have that German uh, car, uh, influence? And has the population of 1500 remained fairly steady since its founding? So that was a question I also had was, um, were there subsequent waves of immigration either from Germany or elsewhere? Yes, there were waves because uh, uh, the, the town, Basically, in the 1830s, from what I've been able to find, was the, it, the population was about 300, uh, and then it it started to grow. And then, yes, there were waves coming. It was uh, from uh, looking at some of the background material that uh, I found in the museum. It was very Germanic for years, um, and uh, they did speak German here for a long period of time. And then, as I noted, even the services in the uh, church were uh, German. Uh, until 1904, uh, but they didn't always speak German all the time, uh, and from what I understand, they did. And from one, uh, there is one account where John Roebling indicated that uh, he wanted them to learn English and, and, and kind of get involved with the community, uh, the broader community. Um, as I, this, this, it, when they founded Saxonburg, the Irish were to our south and west, uh, there were other immigrant groups that had been around the area. So, uh, uh, so they needed to learn English and get involved with the greater community. But in the beginning also, uh, until they got themselves established and really growing their own uh, uh, foodstuffs, uh, they had to go uh, maybe 10 miles away to get grain and get other products while they were still developing the land. Got it. Uh, so Michael L Hirsch, Michael Lauren Hirsch says he's visited Roebling, New Jersey many times. And what is striking is the architecture and hierarchy of homes for workers, management, and executives. Thank you, Michael. Glad to you've been here. And yes, it's true. In the company town of Roebling, there's a very distinct hierarchy of housing. Row houses, semi-detached, freestanding. And it all, where you lived, all had to do with what your job was in the mill. Um, so Michael wants to know, is there anything like this in Saxon, in Saxonburg? What are the buildings like? I think you mentioned that there's still quite a few from the 19th century. There are several and, uh, uh, most of them have a, the German, there's even a little bit, I would say Dutch architecture. Uh, there is one, I, I can't call, I can't find it quickly to uh, call it up. Uh, there was a doctor, uh, Dr. Mershon, he was French. Uh, one of the first, one of the only French people that uh, settled in the area, and he designed and built, and it's still standing, uh, a building that is. He wanted to look an Italian type building, uh, so it's very, very uh, uh, decorative, um, and uh, he. Uh, he it, it, so most of the buildings were very plain, let's say German, very little brick. Uh, there were two. Uh, I'll tell you an interesting story. Uh, even though there was, there's brick, what they call nogging, that's where they put the bricks in between the wood in, in, the, in, the, in the walls. Uh, there are several buildings where they have exposed area where you can see the old timbers and you can see, the, and the, there's a coffee shop in town that has, a, a, was a, a summer kitchen and you can see one of the brick walls like that. Uh, but uh, it's, um, um, not a lot of buildings had exposed brick. Uh, there were two buildings that were brick and they were torn down. <laughs> uh, they didn't survive, the mortar didn't survive and all that. Uh, there were, uh, uh, they, were, they were standing, one of them was a school building too, uh, but that was uh, later in, in the years. But uh, uh, most of it is wood uh, and uh, uh, some of it has, again, some of the original timbers on the inside. But it doesn't look like, I've seen pictures of Roebling, uh, New Jersey, uh, and uh, it, it, it isn't the same scale. Um, Carol Levin wants to know, did the town continue to thrive after John A. Roebling left for Trenton? It went through some evolution. I guess it kind of took away the main industry. Yes, it did. It did. And uh, I'd say it took away some of the panache as well. Uh, and uh, what, what really, it kind of, it stayed as an area of commerce, uh, but it certainly did not have the national uh, draw that it had. 
what happened was the oil boom. Uh, there were oil wells and oil found in this part of uh, Pennsylvania. And there were some oil wells, uh, not very far. As a matter of fact, there was one even in the uh, borough limits at one time. Uh, and uh, that kind of caused another boom. And uh, the town prospered because of that. But I will tell you that there are accounts where the townspeople were not happy because of the rowdy oil workers. Uh, they would come to the bars and all that. So, but they made money for them staying and all that. But uh, so it went through a little bit of a period. And then I think there was a little bit of a lull from what I can read. It just was just a town. And then, uh, it, then it has come back. It's gone through waves, I will say, uh, over the years. Uh, but it stayed, uh, I mean, the, if the business leaves, somebody comes back in uh, and uh, our main street is populated. We did have, uh, uh, there's two other things, two or three other things that made Saxonburg famous. Um, we had a gentleman that uh, started a um, ceramic company here and he built a little factory uh, and we were famous for ceramics. Now that has turned over to another one that's uh, called Duco Ceramics, and uh, they're still here and they ship all over the world. And then uh, uh, outside of town, you may have heard of a radio station called KDKA, uh, the first licensed broadcast station in the country. Uh, they were based in Pittsburgh, but in, uh, in the 1930s, they had their transmitter was built a mile outside of town, and they had put the highest metal structure in the United States, 718 foot tower, was just a mile outside of town. And that was where uh, for years, uh, the KDKA signal broadcasted from. Unfortunately, they left uh, and moved the engineering facilities. There was never the studios, but the engineering, they moved away from here in 39 and 1940. So we lost that as well. One of the streets now called Pittsburgh Street was called KDK Boulevard when they were here and they took the name back after they left. Last thing is there's a company called 26 here, uh, and it's an international company that makes uh, uh, laser equipment, optical equipment, and all that. It's built on the grounds where KDK was, but in the interim, we were just outside of town. We had the second largest cyclotron, which is an atom smasher, was built just outside of town uh, right after World War II, uh, and uh, we had two of the uh, Carnegie uh, Institute was behind the building of it here, and we had two of the scientists that worked on that project actually worked on the Manhattan Project, or the atom bomb. Uh, so we, we had that. So we've been through waves of different things in the area, and we're very fortunate how we've been out evolving over decades. Wow, you had atom smashing. Yes. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, obviously, Saxonburg is a place where people come to do new things, to try to be innovators. Um, okay, Marianne, your decision. So quick question from Teresa Farmer. How old was John Roebling when he died? Uh, he died in 1869. That's, uh, he and was he was? 63. 63. 63. Thank you. Um, and as everybody probably knows, he died after an accident at the, during the design phase of the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, he got, he, his foot was crushed. He contracted tetanus, and due to some of his beliefs in the curative powers of cold water, mm -hmm. uh, which you alluded to, um, he got tetanus and died. Uh, Mary Ann Yersishan, who is a Roebling resident, wants to know, uh, I'm curious as to how the patented device works. I see the wire being loosely twisted before entering the box. Is that where it was more tightly twisted? That's correct. It was brought the in through, uh, I the can't wire go back spinning. to the screen. Yeah, the raw product in that screen, I, I think it would be more complicated to find to put it back on the screen, but the raw product was on spools and then it went through uh, the device and then it was twisted as the men would pull along, they would twist it. Uh, the pattern, that, that uh, brass uh, uh, item that I showed you, it is standing upright. It actually would have been uh, horizontal, not vertical, uh, built on the end of something, uh, one of the twisting items. So the wires would come in and then it would be twisted through to go out. But uh, he, uh, 
uh, by the way, all of the equipment he had here, and I understand the first ones in Roebling, uh, uh, New Jersey, he designed himself. He would not buy equipment from anyone. It had to be his design. He had to make it. He would get people in Pittsburgh to help him uh, manufacture what he needed. Uh, and uh, everything was his to his design and to how he wanted it made. Uh, he would not buy anybody else's product, but it would be twisted and, and go out. And then he, he became, he, he perfected the system and he came up with some other types of devices over time. Well, the brass thing that you showed us is the wrapping is for right. wrapping the cable, correct? Right. So after you make the big cable, you wrap it in wire to keep the, and paint it to keep the moisture out, correct? Right. Correct. Right, right. Yeah, and he so, had a special uh, formula, by the way, for originally it was iron wire, eventually it became steel wire, but it, uh, originally it was iron wire, but he had a, he, he figured out, he, he, he was so brilliant on many, many ways. He, want, he figured out and came up with a formula for that, for the wire, how they, he wanted it, the mills to make the wire, and it was made to his specifications. And it was perfect. I mean, we still have bridges uh, using cables that were made in the 1860s uh, that are still standing. So Fred, tell us a little bit about why you became intrigued with the story of Saxonburg and the story of Roebling when you moved there. I mean, you <laughs> accidentally ended up as the head of the museum. How well, did, what, uh, I mean, you've done a lot of different things. What is it about this story that you like? Well, I, uh, as you had mentioned in the introduction, I had lived in D.C. and I went to the Smithsonian uh, Museums and the others in D.C. a lot. And I, I, I'm, I love history, uh, especially because of having been involved in the news media as well. But uh, when I landed, uh, landed in, in this area, I didn't know we had a museum. Uh, and uh, actually, one day there was a mayor here in town, uh, unfortunately passed away. Uh, who um, knew everybody, knew everything and all that. And she saw me one day on the street walking and all of a sudden I heard this voice from behind me and said, you're new. And I turned around and I said, yes, I am, who are you? Uh, and so she introduced the mayor and she talked to me and she said that she was, uh, I, I kind of knew a little bit that when I first was coming here because I have a, I have a daughter that lives not too far away and I moved here. Uh, so I had visited the area a lot and I kind of knew a little bit about Saxonburg and Roebling but not all to the depths I finally immersed myself in. Uh, but once I started uh, settling here and getting involved, it was just fascinating to me uh, what this town contributed to not only uh, America, but to the world. Um, and I, uh, I've become to believe, and I, I might be too um, rosy or optimistic in my uh, appraisal, but I, I believe that John Roebling while we talk about him as a bridge builder, I believe he connected communities. The more I read about it, and the more I get immersed about what he did here, what he did or, or in, the, in this area and all that, he connected communities. Uh, he did not put ferry boats out of, uh, and barges out of business. Now, they were fading anyhow, so you hear you know that, and the railroads were coming, but he, he built bridges where there were no bridges. I mean, there was no connection between areas. Uh, so you have to, you have to, uh, uh, I, I grew up in the 50s, and I, uh, you, you think about Eisenhower gets a lot of credit for the interstate system. In a sense, Roebling was an early founder of connecting communities because of the bridges. And that's what fascinated me. And then the more I got immersed in it, and the more I learned, it was like, oh, wow. <laughs> and then to find out that we had a building on the grounds here that goes back, because I, I drove by it, and I didn't realize that wire rope workshop, the his significance, and I think a lot of people didn't for a long period of time. But it's, uh, I, I think it's, we're, you all uh, in your family, all of us should be grateful that the community saved and preserved it. I am, uh, I'm amazed that that little building uh, remains from 1832. Um, what was it, you know, after 1848, uh, when Roebling uh, left for Trenton, what happened to that building and how come it didn't, I mean, how did it survive? And really uh, in, I mean, maybe you had to rip out the sheetrock and fake wood paneling or something, but you know, really it is intact. I agree with you. I uh, I continue to research that, and uh, from one, and talking to people and some of the hand-me-down stories, uh, it was vacant for a long period of time, uh, and uh, it was in one family's hands. The land uh, they 
there was some storage. It was used for some storage at one time uh, and all that. There's an older couple, a gentleman that's in his 80s in town that I, I, I use as a resource sometimes. And he told me when he was young, the school bus would used to stop uh, at the corner of Water and Rebecca Street and the kids would get off the school bus, the door wasn't locked and they would go in the building sometimes after getting off the school bus. And he says at one time he remembered seeing some devices or something laying around, uh, but uh, it had been pretty much cleaned out. Uh, and uh, again, by the 1960s, there, the building was not in good condition. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm glad they, dis they decided to save it. And we're all fortunate, and we're very fortunate that it still has so much of the original inside. Now, but there's also a house that John and Johanna lived in and raised their kids, correct? That's correct. That was the church office building I showed you. That's still standing, right. and it still has much of the interior walls are still original. The outside has, uh, it, 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 there's been some changes to the outside, but that, is the, that was their house, uh, the largest house in Saxonburg at the time. And when was the Saxonburg Museum started? Well, we're going to have an anniversary next year, by the way. Uh, it was uh, 1991. We had a mayor here named uh, Roland Cooper. He was the mayor for 32 years. Uh, and uh, he, he was a little bit of everything. Uh, he was a Shriner. He, he was uh, involved with the fire department and all this. But he had a vision. Uh, and uh, uh, as I say to the people that come to the museum, when they first get in, they drive by, they sit down, and they never stopped here before. It's 6,000 square feet. For a town our size to have a building 6,000 square feet is amazing. Uh, and I'm not sure if he ever thought it would have been filled like it is. His uh, two daughters, there's his, his daughters and other family are still in the area. And I, I meet with them, converse with them uh, often. And, uh, uh, but uh, he had a vision and it's very, we're very fortunate. And we have Ro Roebling, we have the Roebling room. Uh, we have rooms dedicated to the German, uh, for instance, we have a bedroom it's set up as if a German house was, uh, had the bedroom. We have a parlor area that would have been uh, how they would have it. We have German sayings on the walls as they would have had on their walls. Uh, and uh, uh, everybody had either had a pump organ or a piano. We have that in the rooms. Uh, we have uh, other areas uh, because of the wagons and the horses and all that going through the area. Blacksmithing was big in the area. We have a display that, uh, about that. And then we also honor the farming that was here in the area. So it has a lot that, uh, that has been donated. I would say 99.9% .9 of what's in the museum was donated by people in the area. They're proud of what they have and they wanted to make sure it stayed here and was visible for other people. We have books, we have uh, some old school books, we have everything, desks from old schools and all that. So we have a lot that helps tell the German story, but also the t what the area has. And I was, again, I'm fascinated and I'm very proud. Uh, I'm only one carekeeper, uh, uh, carekeeper in a long string of people, and I'm very fortunate there'll be somebody that follows me and I hope they have the same passion. Well, I, I hope they do because uh, obviously you've got an enormous passion for it and that makes all the difference when you're trying to tell it to other people. Um, what do you think about John Roebling? Because as you pointed out, you know, he invented, you know, he perfected wire rope and made an enormous difference in the development of the U.S. Um, he created these connections between towns. But as you said, you know, he wasn't really known as a, a fun guy to be around. Uh, and certainly um, Washington Roebling didn't, rec you know, recalled him as a very harsh person. You know, take it with a grain of salt. It was his dad. But uh, what do you think about him yourself personally? I, I'm, I'm fascinated. I mean, just as you read through history, there's so many brilliant men and women who they were to themselves uh, in some ways. Uh, and uh, he certainly was not a public figure in one way about his personal life, but he knew that he could contribute something. And I, I think from my, what I've read and what I've heard and what I've looked through that's here in the museum and all that, I, I, I you, you have to give him a lot of credit for being what a quiet or, or a very stern, not 
to himself person who then knew he had to be polite. He knew he had to have people. But again, when he left Saxonburg, the sad thing is he never came back, uh, which is to me fascinating. You find it, you come to America, you find it, you buy land, you sell it all off you, you, to people that you asked to come here. And then you say, bye bye, you know, and he left. Uh, and I, I uh, but he left enough. And he knew what he, he knew his letters back to uh, Germany, to Prussia. He knew he needed somebody to come do banking. He knew he needed somebody to do general store. He knew he needed somebody to do this. You know, so he was able to recruit people to make the town viable. And then he walks away, which just to me fascinates me, uh, especially when he was so close to the area of 22 miles away, building a bridge, and he would not come back to this town. Now that shows his stubbornness. Now, that there are some accounts, uh, I, I, I can't remember which book, I won't mention the right wrong, I don't want to mention the wrong author, but they, you know, he, he thought some of the people were stubborn germ, Germans. Uh, you know, he didn't think they were coming along like he thought they should, but they really were. I mean, they were building a, a town, uh, a strange town in a new land that was different, but they they did do it. They did do it. I mean, the, uh, 1932 was the 100th anniversary of uh, Saxonburg. Uh, and uh, we have uh, newspaper accounts on the walls in the museum. One of the accounts says there were 5,000 people came here for the 100th anniversary. Now, I'm not sure I'm going to be around in 2032. I'm, I'm sorry to tell you that. But what's it going to be like on the 200th anniversary? But uh, that's a little bit why I wanted to do the 100th anniversary. Uh, 85th anniversary, and I had the opportunity in 2017. But I mean, we had we had a thousand of people here, not at 5,000, but people came, and they uh, actually KDK, by the way, broadcast on their radio, which was heard around the wor uh, world because it, uh, some people in, in England could hear the signal. Uh, they broadcast from here the one of the services uh, that uh, from the church uh, that went involved was involved with the Roebling uh, 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 anniversary in 1932, but. Uh, you know, uh, one of the rolling uh, members of the family uh, came here for that anniversary, just like Chris came for uh, uh, the 185th. But uh, so it is, uh, it is kind of interesting. Uh, but I, you know, even when he was building the other bridges, uh, he was to himself. He really was to himself. But he knew what he was doing. He was focused. And he, and if anything, he was a perfectionist. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Uh, this has been terrific. Thank you so much. It's really, really been enjoyable and I learned a lot. And I think everybody uh, <clears throat> else on the program who was watching did as well. And we really appreciate you, you know, preparing a, a presentation and uh, sharing your expertise and your thoughts with us. Thanks. Thank you. I'm honored to continue the Ro Roebling legacy and for you and your other family members. Uh, I, am, uh, I, I appreciate it. Well, Fred, that's really lovely of you. Thank you. And I have to say, I think it's a story that is endlessly fascinating and remains relevant in so many, so many of the uh, ways today. It's still something that is worth our time to think about and explore. Um, I just want to say, uh, again, thank you so much. And luckily, our next Roebling Road Trip is on a is on the very topic that you mentioned um we will be having a ranger from the allegheny portage railroad giving a presentation about the uh wire rope that john roebling uh created to replace the hemp ropes on the allegheny portage railroad i i'm sure everybody can imagine how much you wouldn't want to be standing by a portage railroad when the hemp rope snapped so I think it'll be a really interesting program. Um, what is the, do we have a date for that? Lynn? It's to be determined. We will be sending out an email with the, the, the uh, details as we get more. Okay, so watch your email. Uh, if you signed up for this, you'll get an email about the next one and it'll be from the comfort of your Zoom room. And um, thank you again, Fred, and thank you everybody for signing on. It was great. Take care. Lynn, you want to say goodbye and then we'll sign off.
Bye, everybody. I'm going to end the call now. Thanks for coming.